Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a, you know, again, it's a pretty shitty Florida day. Uh, today is Thursday. I shouldn't say that anymore because these video, I don't know if they get up on the same day anymore, so it seems weird uh, when I say it and it comes out the next day, but it, well, the hell with it. Today is Thursday and it's muggy and it's sweaty and it's not going to get any better and we all know it. And it's May, and June is coming, and July is after that, and uh, none of the weather bodes well for the foreseeable future. So uh, this is 100% my miserable time of year. And frankly, you know, I know I haven't been doing many videos lately, and that uh, it's one of the reasons this thing has a quirk to it, this particular video. And uh, my apologies. I mean, I'm just, I just haven't been able to get shit ready. I haven't gone to many of these uh, auctions where I end up getting interesting cars. Interesting cars haven't shown up in my path. And I just, you know, I look around at what's available to me and I start falling asleep. I was at a red light the other day and I was watching all the cars crossing my path before I got the green arrow to turn. And I didn't see one interesting car in, in the hundred or more that passed me. And I thought, you know, it is rare. It just is where you find something interesting. So I'm going to keep at it. I'm going to find something cool to do. Things may change up in a way that I come up with better stuff. But for the moment, I'm just in a lull and that's the way it's going to be. Um, I've been deep into copious amounts of the anti-Soviet whiskey. I'm not even sure what's going on anymore uh, with the Soviets. I try to keep track, but it just doesn't make a lot of sense what I'm hearing. I mean, I know they're doing their thing in Europe. It doesn't seem like it's something that should really concern us, but maybe it is. And who am I to say? It's, you know, obviously above my pay grade. But, uh, you know, that said, I'm keeping strong on the whiskey. It's going to keep the Soviets at bay, at least in my personal little world. And uh, that's the important thing. So uh, I will let the higher pay grade folks decide what to do about them. And I'll just keep my head down and keep beating a path forward. Uh, we are definitely living in interesting times. I will say that without question. Uh, we are living in very interesting times. Animals still at an absolute minimum. No goats, no birds. Everything just seems quiet, and I don't know why, but I'll take it. You know, I'm happy enough with it. I haven't even seen Peter's cats. Well, there's a bird there, but that's it. And uh, otherwise, the cats even haven't been around. So we'll just keep going without any animal interference, which is just fine with me. And, you know, I mentioned this in the last video, the Cobra Mustang video, which nobody watched, and I can't blame you, uh, is I've started a Twitter account to support curious cars. And I'm over there posting on Twitter. And, you know, there's a few reasons I picked Twitter. One is because... Well, let's face it. I mean, it's a bird. I mean, there's a sense of irony involved. It seemed to have a synergy there to have a bird-based chat forum, you know, for curious cars. So there was that. And secondly, you know, Elon Musk with this whole trolling thing, I kind of been frankly enjoying that. So I thought, what the hell? I'm going to go over to Twitter. I'm going to start an account. I'm going to bypass the Facebook thing. And I'm going to give Elon, who builds ridiculous, stupid cars that I don't like, uh, a little bit of a boost by taking on a Twitter account. So I'll put a link to that Twitter account in the uh, description here. If you have any interest in going over there, you can have a look. And in fact, I know something some guys have been asking for, and God knows why, is uh, Curious Car Stuff. And Penelope has really forced this issue. If you remember Penelope, I do some of her cars sometimes. Uh, she's, um, you know, kind of a well-to-do car enthusiast who got wealthy by selling, you know, feminine hygiene spray and other such assorted sundries. And uh, anyway, she's a big supporter of this channel, and she wants to make... Uh, uh, curious cars gear stuff and she's made some so uh, we don't have it yet she's only just approved it or whatnot so it'll probably be a month or so before we get any in but uh, apparently there's going to be some pretty cool hats and flasks and I absolutely refuse to put it they're just going to be given away uh, so we're going to figure out how to give them away and uh, that's something that may, you know, get discussed over on Twitter. So there's that. So, you know, if you like this channel, it's probably worth 
uh, you know, checking in over to see what's going on at Twitter. The bonus to that is you can see what all the snowflakes are up to uh, because they're just all over that platform. So uh, I have a giant laugh <laughs> reading some of the... <clears throat> some of the crap that they come up with. But here it is. Look, we're going to do a very short take on this thing. I know I promise that all the time, but this time it's really going to happen. And it's a double thing, because here's the other part of it. Since I didn't have anything ready, uh, this is a card that I bought, uh, I think, at the end of last week. And I really haven't done anything to it. So you're going to see the way a car comes in to a dealer before we do all our little smoke and mirrors tricks to it to make it look nicer, which someday I may actually do a video on that. People will kill me for it, but I may do it anyway, uh, just for fun, because... You know, obviously, when you see a car advertised on a dealer website and it looks absolutely new, hey, chances are strong that the dealer has had a little bit of a helping hand and they can look that way. So this here, this Escalade, this is a raw trade-in as you get it. And you'll see some of the differences, I think, as I, I haven't even washed it. I asked Dalton to clean the windshield yesterday inside and out. So he cleaned it outside. He didn't bother with inside because, you know, Dalton. Why would he bother? Uh, but anyway, long story short, it's a short take, and we're going to dive and leap directly straight into this thing. And what we have is a 2004 Cadillac Escalade ESV. And we'll get into it. Um, look, generally speaking, I don't like SUVs. The SUV craze basically ruined distinctive cars and distinctive automotive styling. It's a common complaint. You hear it all the time, but it's true. Uh, most new cars look like each other. You know, you're going down the highway, uh, you know, one of these little shitty SUVs pass you, and then another one passes you, and they look identical, even though they're from completely different makers. It's like they came off the same assembly line, and they stamped different badges on them. And, uh, you know, it's just one of the... And yeah, look, even more so. I mean, I know there's all the badge engineering arguments that go back years, but it just seems with these SUV things, it just got even worse. And uh, almost every vehicle today has to be an SUV or crossover of some point, whether it's big or small, tiny, large, whatever. They all just look like SUVs, uh, crossovers or whatever, and even the electric ones. They just, you know, everything looks the damn same to me. And the SUV craze just destroyed everything. I mean, now you've got Bentley and Rolls-Royce and Jaguar and Lamborghini and even Ferrari coming out with SUVs. It's absolutely horrible. I mean, you picture the little cobblestone factory in Italy with all the little guys named Luigi with the curly mustaches and stuff, and they're stamping out SUVs. It just doesn't make any sense, but um, anyway, this truck, this Cadillac, is one of the reasons that all of that came to, uh, to pass. I mean, it's far from the first SUV, very far from it, uh, but it was a breakthrough vehicle, and it did enhance and energize the SUV craze. And to some extent, the fault for that lies with the forced downsizing and the government. You can always go back to the government on this stuff. You know, all the fuel mileage stuff, all the malaise stuff, you know, car makers had to start making cars smaller. They had to make them get better fuel mileage. And, you know, so they went away from these big body on frame things that people liked. And, uh, you know, Cadillac even went to these little front wheel drive cars. Once all that happened, the demand for big body on frame cars was still there. And these people had nowhere else to turn but going to trucks. And once they started buying trucks as family cars, the maker said, okay, we've got ourselves a niche here. Let's start start making these things more luxurious and car-like, which they did, and that led to more sales, and then it just all compounded on itself, and before you know it, you just have absolute SUVs everywhere. Uh, but this Escalade was Cadillac's first entry into the SUV market. Uh, and they're now on the fifth generation, by the way. So, I mean, it, obviously it took off. Uh, it's widely credited with saving the uh, company, or at least making the company. It gave it monetary breathing room while it developed the rest of the art and science cars and led Cadillac to where it is today. Uh, this was the first. This was their, you know, art and science is one of these poncy, you know, style. You know, these guys that the car companies hire who are very... 
highbrow and highfalutin and poncy and you know they come up with these artistic things and we're all supposed to bow down to their impressive artistic qualities and uh, Cadillac came up with an art and science approach which of course you know sounds like your second graders day at you know the class but uh, anyway that's what they came up with and the cars all started getting designed that way with a variety of cur you know I remember BMW had that fire thing uh, whatever the hell that was and then anyway this was Cadillac's version of that and what it did was it made it the, the, this SUV the Escalade it made Cadillac less of a niche market for your retired New Jersey firefighter you know who wanted white walls and chrome grills and vinyl tops and pale yellow cars and more of a mainstream luxury choice for there's a bird right around us anyway more of a mainstream luxury choice for you know younger hipper and well-to-do people uh, so it was a big deal for Cadillac uh, and it was made in response they didn't come out with it on their own uh, or at least it wasn't inspired on their own uh, it was in response to the popularity of the Mercedes G wagon you know the standby of the Kardashians the Range Rover was gaining popularity in the 90s the Lexus LX you know a fancy Toyota Land Cruiser basically but mostly the Lincoln Navigator which had come out in 1998 and I think the success of it took Cadillac by surprise uh, it just you know they didn't think it was going to sell as well as it did but it hit the world and people liked it and started buying it and pretty soon the pressure was on uh, Cadillac and GM to have a response. Uh, the word Escalade, by the way, means it's basically a Middle Ages thing, like a siege tactic uh, of scaling defensive walls with the aid of ladders. You know, you see all these guys in their little chainmail armor running up with ladders, putting them over the wall. People are pouring boiling oil on them and you know they all get over and start stabbing people to death it's all great fun uh, but I mean if they're going to use that kind of middle ages or see hey I mean Escalade is kind of a cool manly name but I think Iron Maiden would have been better they really should have gone with that but anyway it went into production only 10 months after it was approved which is extremely fast and um eh, only 14 months after the head of Cadillac very much publicly said that SUVs were not compatible uh, with the direction of the brand. So obviously that was horseshit. Uh, but the first gen Cadillac Escalade, of which, by the way, this is the second, this is not the first, uh, it was just a very cynically done badge engineered Tahoe uh, you know with very even the wheels were the same as they were on the Tahoe Denali they just used different center caps everything was basically the same uh, with very very few exceptions so Cadillac just very quickly uh, responded to something that they thought they needed to do and it worked and uh, that's why the first generation is just so easily overlooked you don't even see it you see one going down the road you think it's a Chevy it was rushed through and uh, it just wasn't um, it just wasn't built to be a Cadillac they put all their time and effort into this the second gen uh, which came out in 02 it actually came out in the end of 2000 as an 02 model in February 01 uh, you could buy one so it was a very early 02 and uh, even though the um, the other the two other GMC and Chevy uh, you know were making full size SUVs they had switched to the uh, GMT 800 chassis in 2000 Cadillac held out they kept the old Escalade going and in 02 or at least as an 02 model they released this one on the GMT 800 and <laughs> To the detriment of car guys everywhere, it just pretty much paid off. And as a result, we have what we have today. Uh, but uh, when it came out, it was, I won't call it a sea change. It wasn't, but it, look, it was a big deal. I mean, it had more power than anything else in the luxury class by a long shot. I mean, the Navigator had 300 horsepower. All the European stuff was in the twos. Uh, even the ML55, uh, which is not really a competitor because it's kind of a midsize SUV, uh, the AMG G car had 340 this had 345 so it was the most powerful of the bunch and uh, 380 foot-pounds of torque and these were pretty big numbers for then and they made a splash uh, there were three models there was this one 
the ESV, which was, um, that means Escalade Stretch Vehicle, by the way. And it was, of course, a long wheelbase version of the base Escalade, which was shorter. And it's just like the, you know, the Tahoe versus the Suburban. You, you had a longer version. Uh, there was also the EXT, uh, which means Escalade Crossover uh, Truck. Uh, and that was basically a Chevy Avalanche-based Escalade that was a little bit weird and not beloved. But, you know, I think by virtue of that, it's probably going to end up being collectible. Uh, but um, I said, there they were. They came out in 02, and they took the world by storm, and people instantly sort of took a shine to them. And we'll get into which type of people in a minute. Uh, but the, the first thing, nobody, including GM, expected to see Escalade people off-roading these things. It just wasn't what it was going to be. And that's why they used an all-wheel drive system instead of having a four-wheel drive. There was no transfer case. There's no shift levers. There's no low range, no buttons to push. Uh, you know, it was just basically all-wheel drive. And 38% went to the front. 62% uh, went to the rear. Uh, what the thing was set up for more than anything was towing, because I think that's what GM, you know, these highfalutin guys towing their formula boats, you know, down to the dock, they may want to do so uh, in an Escalade, and that is what they set it up for. Uh, and uh, it could do it. You know, this ESV version with the six liter, the big engine, uh, could tow 8,500 pounds, which, you know, is not unserious. That's a pretty good amount. Uh, it used the uh, GMT 800 platform again, which when GM makes a truck, their trucks are so important to them, they put a lot of thought and time and money into it. And uh, it was a uh, very, very advanced, it's body on frame design, but it used an all welded boxed ladder frame uh, with hydroformed front and rear sections. Pretty new technology at the time. And uh, that did make it very stiff and strong and uh, usable as a trailerable vehicle. So, so look, it had beef and, you know, love it or hate it, it had style, or at least it was styled very different uh, from the uh, Suburban and the uh, the GMCs. It, it looked different, it felt different, and it had a different impact on the street, whether you like it or not. And I don't think it's any wonder that a bunch of you know, aggressive and well-coiffed middle-aged women who drink wine from a box uh, took it into their hearts or, you know, rappers, they absolutely loved it. Or, you know, people who are in sort of the uh, casual and unofficial pharmaceutical industry. These are the people who went nuts for it. And it, uh, it sold very well and it made Cadillac a lot of money because there was a lot of money in it. They didn't have to spend too much money developing the platform. They could focus on the cosmetics. And uh, it just flew off the shelves. Uh, people bought a ton of them and it helped make Cadillac a little bit flush with cash and that made it more comfortable and easy for them uh, to come out with the rest of the art and science stuff and develop all the CTSVs and six and seven hundred horsepower Cadillacs that had absolutely nothing to do with Cadillac's history. So, all right, look, I'm going to pause it for a minute there and then we're going to get into the exterior styling of this thing. Uh, while I'm doing that, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how a car comes into a dealer and what we do to it, and uh, then we'll move on the, uh, from there. So hold on one moment, and we'll get the ball rolling afterward. All right, so let's keep rolling. And, you know, it's interesting that I have to step so far back to get this whole thing in the viewfinder, which, uh, you know, there's an irony involved. When the government the regulations and, you know, industry compliance lead to smaller cars. It also leads to a lot of Americans driving something the size of a school bus that gets, you know, worse gas mileage than your average oil tanker. So it just shows you that the road to hell can be easily paved with good intentions. But that said, anyway, well, look, we'll jump right in. So this was the first of the Cadillacs to use what they called the art and science styling approach. And uh, what that meant would it would have a lot of creases, curves, other things that were not historically Cadillac. And uh, that was how they were going to help modernize the line. And this was the first of them. Uh, but beyond that, again, because it's basically a Suburban, it's basically a full-size GM truck. The thing is huge. I mean, it is wide, it is long, and it is tall. It's over six feet tall. I mean, it towers over me uh, when I'm walking around it. It's just absolutely enormous. And people weren't used to these giant SUVs when these cars were prowling the streets back in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, I mean... 
there had been the Grand Wagoneer, there had been other SUV, the Navigator was obviously out, but this was still kind of a new and debatable and ironic thing, these things running around. Uh, but um, uh, that was the biggest point, I think, of the Escalade, was that it was just friggin' enormous, which it was. Uh, it had body color bumpers, you can see that, um, you know, they're all very color coded up in the front. You got fog lights at the bottom. You've got these enormous halogen headlights, uh, which, uh, you know, absolutely show the world that you're behind them. Uh, it, the front end was very different from the Chevys and the GMCs, so, you know, they did take away from some of the badge engineering that way. You had these chrome rims. Later on, Caddy, the Escalades would come out with the first 20 inch rims. Maybe that was a tip of the hat to uh, uh, their hip hop segment, but uh, anyway, by, you know, this one, it was still the uh, probably 17s on this thing. Um, and there just wasn't that much chrome on it. I mean, you've got a satin nickel grill uh, with a chrome strip on the top, but that's it. You've got no other, you know, they've got a big plastic Cadillac emblem up front, but not a lot of chrome. Uh, you got the chrome wheels, you got chrome trim on the running boards, you got chrome trim on the door handles and up top on the luggage rack. But that's it. The windows are not encased in chrome. The windshields, the taillights, the bumpers, none of that stuff. Uh, so chrome was basically at a minimum. They had put an enormous plastic Cadillac emblem in the back of the tailgate, which you just have to love. See it as a big rear wiper there, which looks very utilitarian. You can't help but see some of the, you know, suburban stuff coming through. Uh, giant sensors in the uh, rear bumper for backup. This was, of course, in the days just before cameras, so uh, rear bumpers, uh, sensors were a big thing. Uh, the body cladding is really over the top, you know. It's running from, of course, the bottom of the car all the way up over the wheel arches. So even when you're loading up there on the top, the uh, cladding sort of bumps against you. It's just got a tremendous amount of uh, body cladding. And there you see the Escalade ESV stuff. Now, again, the second part of this thing is this being a fresh trade-in, it gives you an idea of the stuff dealers fix. So you see we're missing a lens cover on the uh, driver's side uh, fog lamp. So obviously I've got to order a new one. You have to decide whether or not you're going to uh, replace both, but they look pretty clear, so I probably won't have to. Uh, there's some scuffs on the bumper. So we have a mobile painter guy who's going to come in and take care of that. It's going to look perfect. Uh, this has chrome rims, so there wouldn't be any fixing them. Thank God they don't have curb rash. Uh, but if they did, we have a guy who comes in and makes the wheels look nice. And, uh, you know, obviously you get a detail, but Dalton's aren't really worth mentioning. But, of course, that would polish it up all very nicely. Uh, getting into the back, you can see there's another little scuff on the rear bumper. That's something we have fixed. And you just sort of go around the car and see the little things you can do uh, to take away what we call buyer objections and make the thing look even nicer than it is. But uh, I'll tell you this. If I was privately buying this truck and I showed up somewhere to buy it, I'd be very happy with the condition, uh, which is one of the reasons I decided to do a video on this particular car. So, uh, all right, look, let's get into the hatch for a minute. Uh, it's got a double thing, so you can prep oh, for the glass. <sighs> Obviously, I've left it locked, so let me get that. All right, so this car has a double hatch. You can press this button here and lift up just the rear window, uh, which is, you know, useful if you're just unloading cargo or throwing a kid in there, or doing whatever it is you do. Uh, you can have very quick, light access to that. Uh, if you want the whole hatch, you get this guy down here give it a lift and then you've got access to the back and uh, cat you know because this is the ESV Escalade stretch vehicle there's a ton of room back here uh, it still has the um, luggage cover which is nice because those have usually vanished uh, Cadillac made that third row seat very light uh, intentionally. It weighs like 40 pounds or something. It's got an aluminum frame. Uh, you know, the previous versions, you had to be Popeye to go in there and get that thing out. It weighed a ton. This one is much, much lighter. So when you get rid of those and move the uh, second row seats forward, you get a ton of room. Uh, but anyway, you can see back here it's nice. You haven't even vacuumed it yet. This is just the way it is. But they give you a nice big stitched cover. You've got a 12-volt outlet over here. Uh, you've got... Um, 
I don't see any holes in that. It looks like it would be a subwoofer type thing, but it doesn't seem to be going through. And then you get into this, which I haven't opened. I find all kinds of weird crap in here, but all I'm seeing for now is the uh, some kind of disgusting rag, and uh, there's the net you could deploy to. Uh, key. There it is. So it's got an infant containment net. That's nice. It doesn't look like it's been used. I like buying a car from people who have a little little brush and, you know, whatever to clean stuff up. But I presume you could take this, this uh, net, deploy it with the uh, anchors here and over here, and then you've got a place to store any infants you might have to take with you uh, by catching them up in the net and, you know, leaving them in the back. Uh, this was also just before they started going nuts with the uh, tailgate push down, so all they give you is this big leather handle to grab. And uh, if you're a small, aggressive blonde woman, you're going to have to use your muscles. I'll have a look under the hood. Everything's harder when you do it one handed. Oh, there we go. No, that's not it. There it is. Okay. All right, and it's filthy under there, but that's fine. This will all be mint and beautiful, and people, oh my God, these people kept their engines so clean. I do love dealer tricks. Uh, these ESVs, the stretched ones, came uh, with this Vortex 6000, the uh, six liter. Uh, it put out 345 horsepower, which was then best in class, uh, 385 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, in the shorter version, you got the 4.3, or the two-wheel to 4.3, sorry, the 5.3 uh, LS motor, which was, um, I want to say 285 horse, but uh, this one, you had to get the big dog. Uh, it had um, aluminum heads on an iron block. They were high compression heads. I think you got to run super in this thing, but maybe not. And uh, just a terrific engine. Uh, it's made into a 4L60E uh, tweaked four-speed automatic, which is very smooth and, and uh, beefy, you know, to take uh, the towing and take advantage of the horsepower this engine had. Uh, it would pull 0 to 60 in 7.8, which was significantly quicker uh, than the prior Escalade and significantly quicker than the Navigator that it competed with. Uh, it would do a quarter mile in 16 seconds at 86, uh, which is about what like an 85 Firebird would do with a V8 in it. So, <laughs> I mean, it definitely had a lot of pep. Uh, for 2004, <clears throat> and that was a big part of it, selling features. Uh, they limited the top speed to 108 miles an hour. Uh, it could have gone faster, but I guess they figured that was the limits of its uh, aerodynamics. And uh, the thing would weigh, what, 6,000 pounds, basically? So uh, it's an insanely big, heavy, and crazy uh, piece that, um, you know, is not that easy to push down the road. You need a need an engine like this to make it reasonable. Uh, it's got speed sensitive steering, so uh, this is one of those things that um, car magazines talked about at the time. You know, they said the people on a 911 would be hateful about the, uh, you know, the way this thing, it, was, it took zero effort, it's cool whip, you know, at the four corners. But you could still navigate through a crowded, you know, Home Depot parking lot, sipping an iced coffee with two fingers. And that's just not something you're gonna do in a 911. So, you know, it's got some of the stuff that can. And of course, that's why these little aggressive, angry, blonde realtors could drive them, uh, is they were just pretty damn easy to drive. Uh, they also, for the first time, used Stabilitrack, which was that, the sort of magnetic dampening at the four corners that became very popular in a very good system. So it could beef up the suspension to cut down body roll and uh, adjust the shocks infinitely to uh, make it smooth or compliant or, you know, handle well down the road. It, no, it does not. It's not a car you want to take on the skid pad. It's not a truck that you want to, you know, drive on the racetrack. Uh, but for what it is, for 6,000 pounds of rolling insanity, it actually handles pretty well and it's pretty easy to steer around. It gives you a pretty nice ride. Uh, the brakes are just standard four-wheel disc. You have ABS, uh, bigger rear than front, which is interesting. So you got 12s in the front, rears in the back, and uh, it does manage to uh, drag the car down pretty well. Uh, it also used a computer uh, controlled uh, road sensing suspension. That's we the Magna Steer, the Magna Flux, you know, shit. 
and uh, the, there was a heavy-duty trailering package, which uh, this one had, so it's able to, uh, you know, haul the big load. So I'm going to pause again very, very quickly, then we're going to hop into the interior, have a look at that, and go for a drive. All right, let's have a look inside. Uh, you see that big LED third brake light up at the top? That was another distinctive feature of the Escalades. And uh, quite a bit of the styling on this car, the art and science thing, originated in the what they evoke concept car, which had come out a few years before and laid the groundwork for uh, what Cadillac was going to become. But yeah, anyway, you know, even though it's a big Suburban, they did manage to make a few styling tweaks. Have a look inside the back here. Okay, so I think the year before they came out with the rear bucket seats uh, instead of a uh, center bench. And uh, people seemed to like that. It's probably an option. You could get either or. But here's where you start getting into the mismatch of badge engineering. I mean, basically, you have a full size truck with mostly truck appointments. The Cadillac guys have to take it and make it look and feel like a Cadillac. So uh, the first thing they do is lathered every seating surface with what they call their nuance leather, uh, which is very nice leather. It has a very nice smell to it. It's the way that leather should smell in a car. So you get a nice wafting of, uh, you know, uh, a nice smell, aroma when you open the door. They put things like, okay, so here you've got a very cheap, you know, plasticky skid plate that they put, but they made it, you know, they put a Cadillac emblem on it. <laughs> Oh, it's just, I don't know. This is the kind of shit that bothers me. You have a basically very cheap suburban door panel, but they've put in a little bit of perforated leather here with real wood, real Zebrano wood here. And again, that's what makes it a Cadillac. Uh, ditto a chrome door handle. And you see a big speaker there in the back and a reflector and a little bit of carpet down there. Uh, you get in here and there's frankly a little bit of a surprising lack of leg room, uh, you know, for uh, being a big car, but yeah, it is what it is and here you see the rear heated seats and audio controls which was you know back then maybe enough to keep your kids happy as they're running around and a uh, very cheap cup holder set up here you know i say cheap because if it were a mercedes it would come out in some sort of an extended arm with springs and hinges on it that thing would break in three weeks where this is going to keep working uh, even as it is now 18 years later so there is that going for it uh, you also have a nice little armrest that pulls out and uh, a place to put your stuff and your canadians are going to be you know they're going to be pretty damn chipper back here with the rear air conditioning you have vents up there for the uh the back seat guys the three that you can squeeze they have all these cheap little plastic buckets and cup holders to put stuff and um you know all in all everyone's going to be fairly chipper uh you also because again these are vehicles that may be used in drive-by shootings. You have nice places to put your Tech 9 or your Uzi uh, in these little pockets here. Uh, and um, although I will say drug storage in the back does seem to be at a bit of a minimum. Head up to the front. We'll fire it up and go for a spin. See these big mirrors again, the same ones you find on a Suburban. They have the turn signal indicators in them. So the old guy, he'll still drive from Ohio to Naples with those things on, you know, the whole way. But at least he has a chance of seeing them. You also see that nice big running board and you see how filthy it is because this car hasn't been detailed yet. Uh, same story up front, cheap Suburban door panel with Cadillac accoutrements. You've got the Zebrano wood, which is real. You've got the perforated leather. You've got the same door lock indicator I've got on my basically base Chevy Silverado. Uh, they did plug in this, um, you could change the pedals, but I think the key has to be on. Anyway, you've got your memory seats there with your variety of heated seats and a very cheap looking switch gear, which does all your windows, locks, and mirrors. And then the uh, Bose system. Uh, these are 10-way power seats with memory. Uh, they're nice. Maybe I should rip them out of there and put them in my truck. Uh, they, this did, GM was one of the first companies to start putting, they weren't the first, Mercedes did it before them in the SL, but making the seat belt anchor to the seat uh, made all the engineering a little bit easier for all those guys. So you can see that this one does have a, a seat belt that's uh, anchored there at the top of the backrest. All right, let's fire this thing up. And uh, being 04, still a very traditional standard key setup. 
Okay, so let's see what we got. This is the same instrument cluster I have in my truck. It's identical with a few little extra bits of trim. And it's just fascinating to me the way all this crap works. So uh, over here you've got your uh, transmission temp gauge, you've got your tack, you've got your 120 mile an hour speedo, you got a little information display telling me to buckle my seatbelt, and you've got your full gauges. You got a voltmeter, you got your oil pressure, uh, you've got your fuel, which is almost on E, which I decided to keep it there because you might as well get used to it. Uh, it's also got um, a temp gauge. You've got a tilt steering wheel. They didn't make it fancy. They didn't make it power. It just is what it is. And then you've got this butterfly style steering wheel with the four prongs and a little tiny airbag in it uh, with uh, multifunction knob shit on uh, the prongs. So you can do your, you know, you got your um, information. It has a bunch of different information. You get into your dometers, your personal trips, your business trips, uh, hour meters and logs, all this other crap nobody probably ever used. Uh, you can change uh, key dependent settings with you know, all of this kind of stuff. It just goes on and on. Like four different languages. You've got some kind of voice command OnStar there. Ready. Oh, God, with this angry OnStar woman. Uh, that was a way to make calls before Bluetooth was a thing. Uh, you've also got a uh, stock over here that gives you your cruise control, uh, your headlights and your wipers. Uh, you know, shut up. Slower, please. Slower, please. This thing is correcting me. Thank you for correcting me. Pardon? Thank you for correcting me. Pardon? Be quiet. Digit dial, please say yes or no. No. Dial, please say yes or no. No. Delete, please say yes or no. Cancel. Thank you. Goodbye. <sighs> anyway. Uh, up here you've got your uh, visors, which of course you'd have to have with your cocaine mirrors. You see a little microphone there for that irritating OnStar thing. Uh, here's all your rear AC controls. You've got your uh, garage door controls. You've got lights. You've got this big power sunroof, which uh, is one of the very few options that Escalades could have. I think this diamond tricoat paint was one and uh, the power sunroof was another. Uh, the dash, again, it's cheap plastic, but they've tried to make it look a little more escalady. You've got some Zebrano trim on this, uh, you know, dash cover. I've left all the little smelly, like this is, again, this is how this thing got traded in. It just, you know, has these little air fresheners. Uh, very cheap headlight switch with automatic fog lights and your rear wiper. Uh, if this had a transfer case and four wheel drive, that would be right there. As it is now, it's a terrible place to stuff narcotics because they'll just come flying out or a gun nothing's gonna stay in there the only thing that could stay in there is your wallet which I have used in another truck like this uh, because it you know it pressures against the sides and holds it uh, they did give you pretty nice in dash infotainment at the time uh, you've got uh, let's get some AC going in this thing so warm in here that is freezing air conditioning, thank God. Anyway, you've got this little screen, but it's pretty modern for the time. It gives your navigation, it gives your radio. Yeah, okay, Bruce Springsteen. Uh, it's a Bose system with a bunch of speakers and subwoofers and amps and all that crap, and it's nice. Um, and that's it. I mean, it's it's nav and it's stereo, so I'm not going to get into all the different crap, but it's there, and it's not too bad. You could even use it today, and uh, I presume it's CD-based, so if I exit that, this is probably my nav desk. Yeah, now I can't have nav, so I'll put that back in. Uh, you do have a CD changer down here and a place that'll be interesting to see if Dalton bothers to clean. Uh, down here you have uh, dual side climate control again in the cheap GM setup. Uh, you have more little cheap plastic switch gear for your parking sensors and your traction control. You got a glove box over here. You got a faux leather wrapped oh shit bar on top of the um, uh, the dashboard. Uh, they gave you these uh, Cadillac emblazoned headrests. That was one of the differences with the Cadillac. And uh, in the back, I don't know. We'll see. I put it in reverse. We'll see if it pops up. Yeah, there you see the red and yellow lighting there in that corner. If I start backing up, maybe it'll do it. It'll start sensing what's going on. Let's zoom in on that. No, it's just going to let me hit. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so you see it went yellow. If I get a little bit closer, 
it should go yeah more yellow and then when I'm really close it'll go red so that helped people especially little blonde women back up their giant escalates at the time and uh, here you see this column shifter they've uh, just in a Frankenstein manner stitched on some leather onto it um, too far and the um, if you press the end of it it's your trailer you see you have a little trailer there and that'll change the shift points and some other crap to make it so uh, it won't be hunting and seeking if you're trailering while you're going over hills it won't be downshifting too much. It'll hold out the shifts a bit longer and shift a bit firmer. Uh, getting down into the center console, you have a nice little narcotics or mini handgun compartment there. You've got your in-dash CD changer. You've got a Bulgari clock, uh, which is telling people that, um, you know, hey, I'm not, you know, poor. I can have a very fancy clock. It was the war of the clocks. Lincoln, I'm sure, had Cartier at the time. Let's go up into the shade somewhere. The sun is my enemy this morning. All right, there's the shade. Anyway, fancy Bulgari clock. Uh, you've got, again, you know, you've taken cheap GM ashtray covers and covered them in wood. I think this is even fake Zabrano. It's real on the doors, but I think this stuff is fake. And you've got cup holders, and of course none of it has been cleaned up uh, because this car is just fresh on a trade. Uh, this uh, big center console doubles as an armrest. You have a place for change. You have another 12-volt outlet and a place to put your CDs. So, uh, all very nice stuff, and let's go for a ride. And, you know, this is the thing that these these people that I don't like drove, you know, I, the people who say I like to sit up high. <sighs> I like to sit up high. I mean, if it's, it's, it's like sticking a dagger in my ear. But anyway, they do get to sit up high. You feel higher than just about anything else on the road at the time. And uh, you got this nice real wood steering wheel to feel nice at high end. Uh, you also have a compass and a uh, clock in the dash. I don't know how to change that? Maybe it's just a. Sorry, maybe it's just the temp. Yeah, no, it's both the compass and the clock, and it gives you your passenger airbag indicator. And here's all your irritating OnStar crap uh, right on the mirror. So, all right, I tell you what, I'm gonna pause it for the sun. We'll pick it up at the end of the street. Don't know if I mentioned that Tony Soprano drove one of these. Pretty much a dead ringer for this one, actually. It was the vehicle that he uh, suffocated his nephew in. I mean, you got to say, that big LS motor gives you some pretty good throttle response for a 6,000-pound vehicle. It gets up and moves, and I guess that was part of the love people had, including Tony Soprano, uh, for these particular vehicles. You always had very light steering, nice and easy, you know, nothing to it, light braking. You got adjustable pedals, so even a little tiny angry blonde woman who drinks wine from a box can, um, you know, can drive it without having to stretch or sit on a phone book. And uh, it's just part of the reason that they took off. And of course, the other big part is what we talked about. People want big cars. They wanted big full frame cars. Where else are they gonna go? They had to go to trucks. Here it is, so. And uh, of course, being the SUV, you had that whole tax write-off thing where people could uh, basically buy an Escalade and uh, write it off their taxes, or at least, you know, by virtue of that, get a pretty, <laughs> they called it like the free SUV law. You know, again, I'm not going to get into uh, government largesse and stupidity, but one could probably fill books with that. Nice kick down out of that automatic. Nice scream of rage from the V8. Uh, you know, I'm not going to argue that it's not a nice, easy car to drive. You know, obviously, I don't want to do too much cornering. I'm not going to be doing a lot of handling. But as far as cruising the boulevard, you could certainly do a lot worse. And uh, that is, again, a big part of why they sold. So you've got all of this stylistic impact. Uh, a car that screams, whether you like it or not, Cadillac, uh, screams, hey, I'm expensive expensive, screams, hey, look at me, and then get the frig out of my way. And uh, it's no wonder that the worst humans in society went out and bought one. In my mind, I just don't think, I think it was made for, tailor made for them. Uh, so anyway, I'm not going to bore you with, you know, minutes and minutes of driving uh, a leathered up Suburban. I will just say that, uh, 
yeah, you know, I get it. I like trucks. I'm a bit of a truck guy because I need trucks. I tow stuff and I can understand why there was a draw to this thing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's one of the horsemen of the apocalypse. This particular Escalade when it came out is part of the reason that, you know, America is such a shit show today, in my opinion. <laughs> in my humble opinion. So anyway, there it is. I'm going to try to come up with more stuff to do. I have to. I have to get more videos going. It's driving me crazy. Uh, don't forget, if you if you care, go over and have a look on Twitter. We'll have a little conversation going over there. And, uh, you know, we'll keep an eye out for any birds. And uh, otherwise, thank you guys so much for having a look, subscribing, bell ringing, whatever the hell that is, and uh, whatever else it is that we do to keep things going. And uh, we will see you with the next one. Take care.